All right, so while I still have a captive audience, I do want to say uh, a few words, and uh, more than a few words, so this is going to take a few minutes. So uh, if you uh, are eating, hopefully you have some food in front of you. So please get comfortable. I'm going to take us uh, a walk down memory lane. So John Gregory Papp was born on August 26, 1945. After 72 years, 17 month, 7 months, and 16 days, he passed on April 12, 2018. A few days ago, a friend from Lebanon shared an old Lebanese saying, He who gave birth never dies. Now my brother and I, as posterity, will continue to carry his flame and add to the illumination he's brought into this world. Yet creative birth goes beyond the physical conception of children. Everyone in this room is drawn together by my father's energy that touched each of us. John Papp's birth and death continues to strengthen the bond of everyone in this room. Laughter, discussion, and kindness he shared with us all, and we with him. His life was one of perseverance, to endure whatever life threw at him, to look ahead with hope for a better future, and sacrifice for those he loved. And through the indomitable strength of his will to overcome the challenges in his past, in his path. Um, but... I want to revisit his life of where he came from that has brought us all together. So John's grandfather came to the United States from Hungary over 100 years ago, arriving at Ellis Island in New York City Harbor, greeted by the Statue of Liberty. I was once told from a Hungarian in Budapest that Pat means father, related to the papacy of the Eastern Catholic Church. And John's father was a hard-living Cleveland detective who rented a house on East 120th Street in Buckeye Road in a predominantly Hungarian neighborhood in Cleveland. John grew up on the second floor of a crowded duplex house with his older brother Dennis, his mother Marguerite, and his father John Pat, nicknamed Brownie because of his proclivity for getting suntan brown. John's Hungarian grandmother, uncle, and aunt and cousin lived on the first floor below his apartment. His father worked in the rough and tumble policing of the pre and post prohibition era when the law and the mafia were often indistinguishable. His mother Marguerite was president of the parent teachers organization and his parents were always well-dressed and dancing around the popular dance halls in Cleveland on the weekends. John's humble beginning in a working-class family instilled a work ethic that animated the rest of his life. He got his first job as a paper boy when he was nine years old, waking up early, rain, sleet, snow, or shine to deliver the Cleveland Plain Dealer to earn a few extra dollars every week from sometimes very difficult customers. My father once told me a story about a customer who wouldn't pay for the newspapers he delivered. So his father, Brownie, drove him to the customer's house, got out of the car and knocked on the door. When the customer answered, he faced a menacing brown man with a gun pointing at him. My father never had problems collecting from that customer again. But that was the rough environment he grew up in. Yet his childhood wasn't all toil and violence. Although he was smaller and shorter than other children his age, he had boundless energy and loved playing sports and games and enjoying the outdoors. He learned card games like spades from his grandmother on his mother's side who doted on him and gave him the sunny disposition so many of us came to love. He went fishing with his father and brother and developed a love of the outdoors that he instilled in my brother and I. And with money saved from his paper route, he would go to Cleveland Indian baseball games, oftentimes by himself, memorizing every statistic of every player, and during the disappointment of countless near championship wins by Cleveland sports teams like the Browns, Indians, and Cavaliers. Yet he was no Fairweather fan. He loved these teams to the end. But a policeman's annual picnic changed his sports orientation when he won a silver dollar for running faster than other boys in a foot race. At Cathedral Latin, he began running track and cross country. A seven inch growth spurt in less than a year propelled him to dominate long distance running in the Cleveland area. Yet while he was racking up trophies, winning city and regional cross-country meets, he was never given recognition from his father. His father never went to any of his competitions. One time he came home after taking second place at an all-city meet. He had a huge trophy for being the second fastest in the 800-meter run. His father asked him how he did. I took it second place, he boasted. His father surprised him. I was there. I saw it. Second place is in shit. Now imagine the disappointment from going from the adrenaline high of winning to confronting a father who only watched him compete once. And when my father was recognized as the second fastest person in the city, his father shattered him. 
Yet my father went the opposite direction with my brother and I, as I'll soon discuss. So in 1962, he enrolled at Case Institute of Technology with a partial scholarship in mathematics. Outside of academics, he focused on cross country and track, winning nearly every race he ran, and was inducted into the Case Western Reserve Hall of Fame for sports. He joined the Phi Delta Theta fraternity, making lifelong friends with his fraternity brothers, Rich Bertolo, Tom Riley, Ted Lakitis, uh, who became honorary uncles for Chris and I. At John's father's funeral in 1965, he was introduced to Donna Smith through a neighborhood friend which began a relationship lasting over 50 years. John and Donna watched The Sound of Music on their first date. When Donna returned home that night, she told her sister, Jean, I met the man I'm going to marry. Jean asked skeptically, how can you know? You haven't even dated him that long. And my mom replied, I just know. And no, she did, as she brought John into her large family of five sisters and two brothers, and John brought her into his life with neighborhood and family friends and fraternity brothers. John and Donna got married at St. Michael's Church on August 12, 1967. They lived in an old gardener's house on the Mather Estate in Bratnock. These were some of the happiest times of, as a newly married couple with my father finishing his master's degree and my mom working at Capitol Records. But the Vietnam War ripped away their innocence as my father's draft number came up. He always said that the only lottery he ever won was the one that sent him to Vietnam. Despite being in graduate school with a letter from Alcoa saying he was to be employed in a U.S. factory making armaments in support of the war, his number was up. While we hear the chicken littles with bone spurs justified Vietnam deferments beating their chests as the loudest warmongers, my father rarely spoke about his time in Vietnam and never boasted about the war. When I pressed him, he did tell me about one story, about how he was in a free fire zone, meaning that American troops were told to kill any Vietnamese in the area. When he came upon a rural village with only women and children, he called in American helicopters to detain the civilians. When he got back to base, his commanders were furious at him for wasting resources when he was justified in killing anyone in the vicinity. My father saved those lives by not committing war atrocities. And he taught me that war is hell and that we need to be skeptical of anyone calling for war, especially those far from the front lines. Years later at a reunion with soldiers from his unit, they all thanked dad for keeping them alive as sergeant in charge of their unit. In 1970, he returned to Cleveland from Vietnam to finish his master's degree and complete a PhD in metallurgy. In 1975, his first son, Christopher Ryan, was born. In 1978, I was born. For the next seven years, my mother, my brother, myself, and my father traversed the United States. He helped build a manufacturing plant in a small farming town in Atlantic, Iowa. He then moved to Yorba Linda, California, outside Los Angeles, where he worked for Gould Industries on a first-of-the-kind lead battery recycling operation. <coughs> In 1985, we moved to the quiet western Michigan beach town of Muskegon, where he planted roots for the next 12 years. At Lauren Industries, he helped build one of the most successful aluminum coil anodizing operations in the world. He also became involved in all of his son's sports, in basketball, baseball, football, and soccer. He was the coach, the driver, and the organizer every season of every sport, and eventually became president of the Sailor Soccer Club, which still exists today. He was a father to my brother and I, that he always wanted, but never had. He was always there for us, supporting everything we did, cheering and yelling from the stands, consoling us when we lost and celebrating when we won. And the Pap House was always welcome, always welcome visitors. My brother and I had sleepovers every weekend, and he would cook pancakes in the morning. Our pool became the neighborhood pool. He welcomed everyone with a smile, and all my friends loved him. Upon hearing his passing, my childhood friend Kevin Balcom wrote the following. I love that man. I loved your entire family. They've meant so much to me. Unforgettable memories of your family's unwavering love and compassion still implanted in me. Some of my favorite childhood memories are from your family's loving home. With my mother, my father created a home of loving kindness that touched everyone he came across. In 1997, I moved away to college and my father finished his career working at Aluminum Coil Anodizing Corporation outside Chicago. <laughs> As his health began to waver, my father and mother moved back to Cleveland. We soon, we soon learned about the cruelty of Parkinson's disease. But only in the past year did we learn that all Vietnam vets with Parkinson's are entitled to VA benefits based on exposure to Agent Orange. 
As a physical ailment disabled his nervous system, his will would not stop fighting. He continued trying to walk to help clean up the house and carry bags so he could be of service to others. Despite the pain and suffering he felt until he took his last breath, he was always looking to go, to walk, to move his body and do something of value. To his dying day, he never relented fighting his disease because he was a fighter and one of the strongest people I have ever met. He lives on in my brother and I, and we will keep his memory alive as everyone in this room. So to John Path, may you rest in peace. Thank you, Evan. Those are beautiful words. There's going to be some overlap. We did not coordinate this, but um, for the most part, he was given the, uh, the history, and I'm going to give a little more of the feels, I think. All right. And thank all of you for being here. Um, I know some of you come from very far away, and he loved all of you. Um, and I'm just really happy to see all you here. Obviously, this is not the way I want to see you, but any chance I get to see you all, um, it's, it's a good day. It's, it's, uh, it's good to see you, for sure. Um, the tremendous outpouring of support means the world to me and my family and um, it shows how loved my father was and how many people he had touched um, and he had a hell of a life. I want to uh, thank my wife for being my rock. You never know how important people in your life are until a crisis <clears throat> and you've been nothing short of spectacular. Thanks to my brother Evan for being a great supportive brother and for your heartfelt words today. You've been right beside me and, and mom and the rest of our family through these tough times, and it means the world. Thanks to my mom for taking such an amazing care of my father. And whenever I call, you're always there for me and my wife and my children. You've never let us down. And thanks to my children, Saoirse, Rowan, Fiona, and Liam for giving me my life meaning. I never could have appreciated it without you. And through you, I've, I've better understood my father and felt more connected to him. It's been overwhelming reading the outpouring of love we received and the stories I've heard through email, text, phone calls, and social media. He clearly had such a positive impact on people's lives. When you grow up with someone, it's easy to miss who they are. You just live with them and you see their temper, you see their flaws more than maybe you see the good because you know, he won't let me do what I want to do on a Friday night or something stupid like that. He's, but to the outside world, he, he was, I think, presented a different picture. He was just normal to me. He was my dad. You know, isn't this what all dads are like? And then I see the things people said about him, and I realize he was not an average person. My, one of my best friends from high school wrote me and said he was the dad I wish I had. Um, you know, multiple people said, man, your dad was the coolest. He was, he was so cool. Um, one friend wrote, he made me a better person. I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize. I, didn't, I just didn't know. I took him for granted. Uh, there are several stories how talk, kids talk about our house being a home away from home. Or their favorite childhood memories were our house, and my dad was a huge part of that. Or the people he worked with, who wrote and said he was the best boss they ever had. Or the fellow soldiers from Vietnam who said they're alive today because of him. And they start to realize what a tremendous impact he had on people's lives and what a unique, beautiful person he was. Not that life was easy for him. It wasn't handed to him on a silver platter. There were numerous setbacks. He had a rough childhood. He was drafted to Vietnam. His career had numerous ups and downs often because he was too ethical or trusting of the people who were above him. But he never let it break his spirit. Leaving Muskegon was incredibly painful, but he, he persevered. The last 10 years have, marked with physical decline, have been marked with physical decline. His body betrayed him, but he never lost his uh, sweetness and kindness. He never became better. My children may have never known the Hall of Fame track star or the world-renowned metallurgist, but they did know the beautiful person the world could never break. I have so many personal memories, a full rich childhood of happy times, but I can't help but reflect on the last few years. I remember the night my son was born, four and a half years ago. 
My dad was already suffering from severe dementia. But somehow that night was different. The two of us sat in my basement watching a soccer game. We talked like we hadn't in years. Every word was clear. It was this magical experience from the de fighting the degradations of time. I'll never forget that moment. I remember the last time he was at my house in early February. He had already failed a trip to a nursing home, but somehow my mom and he came up to Ann Arbor and took care of my children so my wife and I could just get a little time away. And when my mom and dad were going to head back to Cleveland, um, my dad was sitting on this little couch and I, I came up and sat next to him. And normally at the end of a visit, he's like, all right, let's go, let's pack the car, let's get, get ready. And even up to the last moment, he was still like that. The day that he'd wake up early and he'd pack the car and be ready to go. But Liam came and jumped on my lap and we were just sitting there and it was just shoulder to shoulder and he really at that point couldn't talk very much. He didn't really understand half the time what was going on, but I felt him. And I got a picture with him. And I kind of knew it was the last time he was going to be in my house. And I, 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 he was there though, and he felt me, I felt him, and it was real. I hope my mom forgives me for one more story at the end here, but it's, uh, I think it's <laughs> illustrative of the type of man that he was. So, I don't know if all of you know, but at the end, he really wouldn't sit still. Um, it was not safe for him at home anymore, and when he would go to nursing homes, um, he would get kicked out or he'd fall and get hurt and they'd send him back to the hospital. So finally, they, they stuck him in a, in a psych wing at the, the hospital. And basically, it's locked down, right? So you got to go through like an airlock to get in there. My dad knew enough to know he didn't want to be there. And my mom told me a story about how one time when she was visiting him, he's like, okay, I got a plan. <laughs> Grab your keys, go to the car and start it. Keep it warm. I'm going to wait until their backs are turned. I'm going to sneak out. I'll meet you down there. We'll get out of here. <laughs> He was, uh, was a fighter to the end. Yeah. So one lesson he passed to me, never quit. He also taught me to always do my best, to be fair, to try to see things from others' points of view. He gave me a strong sense of what's right and wrong, and he showed me how to be a kind, wise human being. He wasn't the most open man emotionally. I would ask him about the dark times like Vietnam, and he would avoid the topic. He didn't open up too much about himself or his weaknesses. I think that's because he didn't want to dwell on the negative. When we were choosing a movie to watch, and I would suggest some Academy Award winning, gut-wrenching tragedy, he'd say he'd prefer something Pollyannish. He wanted the happy ending. He saw the world as plenty of pain, but he didn't want to focus on that. He wanted to focus on the positive. And there is enough to go around, especially if we take care of one another. He didn't dwell in the darkness, but he chose to live in the light. I'm just so grateful you were my dad. You truly left the world in a better shape than you found it. I don't know where your soul resides. I want to believe you're in heaven. But I will carry you with me and honor your memory by being the best human being I can be. Just like you taught me. I will try to live in the light. I will think of you and love you always. Thank you.